Okay, so once again, hi everyone. Thank you very much for uh, joining this event. Um, we hope that while people are uh, joining, uh, we will, it will not take a very long time. Uh, I am the coordinator of the European Network of Migrant Women. My name is Anna Zobnina. And uh, today's event, I have to say, it has been uh, a long waited for us as a migrant women network, because the subject of today's webinar and the launch of the report itself that uh, we will share with all of you uh, has been born uh, out of our lived experiences as migrant women and out of the, the experiences of many women in our network. Um, Frohar, my colleague, uh, who is um, in the Brussels office, will present the report itself, but I want to just really deeply thank all the women uh, who took part in writing of this report. Uh, those who have seen the report or those who will see it, you will, you, you will see that it is really a product, a collaborative product that was co-written uh, by a lot of women. Um, we're very grateful for their contributions, for their testimonies, for their expertise. Um, and for us, uh, this, uh, as I said, this subject is, is very important. Uh, the subject of mental health of women in general, of women and girls, migrant women, refugee women in particular. Uh, we understand how under-addressed, how tabooed, and uh, how uh, under research and underfunded um, this 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 topic is. So we really hope with this report and with this uh, webinar um, uh, to start building a bigger initiative that will address in a more serious way the mental health, the well-being, the psychological well-being. Uh, that affects so profoundly the functioning in our life um, of migrant women and girls. Uh, we have today with us um, several speakers. Some of them contributed to the report itself, and I want to say thank you to them again, uh, while others are uh, experts that we invited and with whom we have collaborated in the past, um, and we uh, well, I, I feel sorry that we couldn't make this event bigger where more women who contributed to the report could participate, but this is the format today. And we're very much looking forward to an exchange in the end of, in the end of this um, event. So with this, I'm going to pass the floor to my colleague, uh, Frohar Poe, uh, who is our um, project officer in Brussels, who worked on this report, authored it, and um, she's going to share with you um, the overview and methodology and the conclusions of the report. Uh, thank you so much, Anna. Um, thank you everyone for attending this uh, event, this launch event. And um, thank you for um, to those uh, women who participated as interviewees in the report. Um, so this report wouldn't have been uh, wouldn't have been possible or uh, be written without uh, your contributions. Um, I must say I'm very happy to be able to lead this report. Um, this uh, this was indeed a unique report, or this is indeed a unique report. Um, not not just concentrating on mental health, but highlighting migrant uh, women's access and rights to services, to health services, and to other services. Um, uh, it also covers in one space um, issues such as F FGM, uh, prostitution, domestic violence, uh, motherhood, trafficking. Um, that might have been covered or will be covered in different and separate spaces. So it just covers all these issues, which is so important to mental health and mental, mental well-being of uh, women in, in one space. Uh, it's indeed not an ordinary report of data, but uh, facts told by experts and migrant women themselves. Uh, we try to put the testimonies as it is told or it was told uh, to us. We didn't want to interview a woman for an hour and then take a one sentences out of the interview and put it in a report. 
Um, there are other reports uh, indeed, uh, not concentrating so much on migrant women because we couldn't find any report uh, on migrant women uh, and mental health and mental well-being anywhere in Europe, even academic reports. Uh, but uh, uh, we wanted this report to be um, the words of uh, women, the words of experts and migrant women themselves. Uh, and that's why it's, it's so uh, rich and unique uh, because it's, it's is the is the facts that they is the experiences that they went through. Uh, so um, now I want to give you some overview of um, some of the some of the things that came out of this report, some of the quotes, and then how the recommendations were made uh, out of these like for this report. Uh, so Anna, if you can kindly please uh, put the quotes for me, please. Hello. Anna. Yes, if you, yeah. So, um, so you can see, I'm just gonna go through some quotes. Um, so women are taught to adjust to unfair circumstances while being discouraged to change the world around them, focusing on an healthy attitude rather than unhealthy situation goes hand in hand with self-blaming, blaming, victim blaming, and in theoretical framework of psycho psychoanalysis in mother blaming. Uh, this, the, the, all quotes you see are from the report in the interviews. Women, so uh, the other one is this is uh, an expert, um, Pirit, who is the co-founder of ESLA uh, in Belgium, in Brussels. Uh, why would you ask, do these women not speak about their situation? Because women are not believed. And because they are not believed, they don't trust that people can help them. If we would have a new system where women are believed, it would be an enormous step for them to trust themselves and trust that the system in place can truly support them. As long as, as societies don't recognize sexual violence in prostitution as human rights violations, women and girls trapped in the sex industry will be denied their basic rights. Next. A lot of them, uh, this is uh, in regards to domestic violence, uh, so it's one of uh, our members uh, in uh, Finland, uh, Monica Multicultural Association in Besima was kind enough to give us an interview. So a lot of them have had domestic violence since childhood. A lot of them have attachment problems. And so the trauma is not only that I'm divorced now or my husband is hitting me now. It's what we call a complex trauma or long trauma. Most of the time, women who are victims of such long violence and trauma identify themselves as objects. And this means there is also an identity crisis. Uh, and this is, this is actually a migrant woman who was uh, a survivor of uh, domestic violence who speaks uh, to us herself, she gave. She spoke to me. She gave me this interview. And this part was. Uh, uh, you can see how important it is, and how. Um, uh, so it's so hard to survive as women victim of domestic violence. That's why a lot of women stay in violent relationship, especially migrant women, because they have no help or support from the system. They have nowhere to go to. If you're married to a Belgian. And if you complain, you have a chance of losing your visa. The system refuses them and make things hard for them. So they rather live in the violence relationship, get, get beaten up, get abused, even die, but have a roof over their head and some food for their children and not to be deported. This is very important. So they just, they just wanna stay. They don't want to be deported and that's why they have to just live the life they're living. Uh, next one, please. Even for second generation women, this is um, uh, 
from a research expert uh, in France. So she talks about second generation and how mental health is affecting them. In France, there are studies that show that they are discriminated against during job applications for salaries, for a lot of stuff. So in the end, all the, this discrimination contributes to a worse mental health. And um, this, is, this is migrant women talking uh, themselves. Um, so Anila Noor um, says, I needed to heal. You do need healing process to overcome what you have gone through as a migrant woman. And Shaza says, when accessing services, they all had, um, they all uh, accessed mental health services. And this, this is something that came out of their, there's a long interview you can read in the report, but this is something that was quite um, uh, interesting and it contributed to our recommendations. When accessing services, language is a real problem. In addition to cultural barriers, there is culture behind language. You may say one thing and mean it something else culturally. And uh, Malaika uh, is, um, is an expert also uh, from Holland, uh, but here she, she gave us her story as a migrant woman. When I was given the possibility to see mental health practitioners, they did not give me a chance to be part of the mental health planning. During the sessions, they had the idea that anybody who comes from Africa, this is what they need. They had already made up their mind on the kind of questions they will ask and the kind of answers they will give. My psychologist and a lot of people, people involved with my case were not culturally informed and they were not flexible. The people I met were not really specialists in migrant women issues in perspective of traffic survivors. Next one, please. Um, and this is, um, I put two together, one is from um, uh, Joanna and Lawrence, who is uh, from Make Mothers Matter, and the other one is Zainab uh, Nurzeh who's a refugee artist, so she, uh, they're, they're talking about mother's rights here and uh, mental health. Uh, maternal health care is a right to health. It's supposed to be under the obligations of the EU and under international obligations. And a lot of countries have signed the, this international agreement, but not all the countries have the same social welfare system. And then Zainab says, I'm pregnant with my second baby and have sleeping problem. I have nightmares of what I had seen in Camp Mario and back in my country. I do not know how long it will take to book an appointment and how long after that to see a doctor. As we don't have an idea card, it's hard for us to access anything. It has been two years and we have not even had an asylum interview yet. And in the report, you can, you can read and see that um, this is hand in hand, uh, Make Mothers uh, Matter talks about uh, how uh, hard it is for women uh, to access services um, and also knowing about their rights. And this is exactly what Zainab is saying in, in, this, um, in, this, in her interview as well. And um, this is from uh, Veronica. Uh, she's, um, she lives in the UK. Uh, but she is a migrant woman herself. It's important to build a service within the service in order to support some migrant women. For example, by providing network building, cultural awareness raising, learning vocabulary about expressing oneself in relation to mental well-being via the language classes where many women come should be considered. And this is this is something which was keep coming up from almost all the interviews. Um, uh, for example, uh, almost all the experts in migrant women were talking about um, having um, access to uh, having holistic approach, uh, meaning having um, access uh, to uh, other women, migrant women, having a space to speak to other women, not just like seeing a psychologist, but something more than that, like a peer, a group, uh, a group work. 
um, training and raising awareness to professionals, um, awareness raising program to migrant women about their rights, uh, human rights based education um, and recreation programs by young mi uh, to, mi to young migrant women through education in, in institutions, training to educational institutions, uh, for example, teachers, um, social workers, um, uh, and uh, as cultural diversity, cultural uh, on cultural diversity, cultural sensi sensitivity and integration. This was really important. It was again coming up from all um, all the interviews, and um, this is something else that came up from the interviews, but also outside entity interviews. The support and fund for women-led organizations to continue with their services, and or to add uh, to offer. Um, different variety of services. So funding was uh, quite important and it was highlighted and this is something that um, uh, that's something important that we highlighted in the report and we would like to take it further in the in the next coming up research probably. So um, if you have any questions after um, after the the, the panelists talks you're very welcome and i must say that some of the people who gave us interviews are here and they will talk about um about uh their part and their expertise uh on mental health with us today as well thank you very much for her um, I'm going to pass the floor now to Dr. Caroline Mooney, who is uh, representing a KIDWA organization in Ireland. It's a migrant women network. They're our members, and she's herself a, um, a health specialist. And um, uh, in the report, uh, she contributed with um, um, analysis of their services and understanding of the women who were subjected to female genital mutilation and I hope she will share more with us now. Uh, Caroline, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much, Anna. I can see it's 20 minutes past uh, four where I am. So I'll be done in eight minutes. That's, um, yeah, eight minutes I'll be finished. So we are going to, we are going to look at, um, so my name is Caroline Muni and uh, I work for Akidwa. Uh, that is the network of migrant women here in Ireland, and uh, I am their migrant women health coordinator. So straight to the point, uh, we are looking at uh, our uh, female genital mutilation and how it impacts on women's mental health. Um, we know that um, among the among the many effects, among the many ways uh, which uh, FGM affects Caroline. Women, Caroline, I'm very sorry, I'm being very rude. I have to interrupt you and ask you, is it possible that you move your camera a little bit so that we can okay. see your full face? Okay, like that? Yeah, a little bit up. Okay. Yeah, this is good, this is good, thank you. That's better, oh, it's okay, it's okay, Anna, you're not being rude. Uh, so is that okay, um, can you see me now? I know that my, my uh, for some reason, it's, it's getting on getting, it's keeping on getting dark, I don't know why. So it's fine. We can see. It. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you very much, Anna, for that. And so I, I was saying that um, one of the ways there are so many there are so many effects of FGM on women and girls, and one of our arcing effects is uh, how female genital mutilation affects the mental health of women and girls. And uh, so, like women who have gone through mutilation the issue of mental health because of the trauma which happened to them it keeps on recurring and uh, one reason for this is because uh, as a woman sometimes a person will need to have um to, to get intimate with their significant other the same person maybe might fall pregnant and then she will have to go to hospital and uh, the line of questioning there is no way that woman will not come across questions which would be touching directly on her genitalia which as we know, it was cut. And uh, if that woman, especially she went through FGM type three, it becomes even more traumatic. And why is this? And those ones who have not, who, are, who do not know like what FGM is, it is there uh, on the internet and you can see it, it is in four types. So when I talk about FGM type three, a woman's body is sewn like a piece of two pieces of garment like this, the way you put together two pieces of garment and then you stitch them together and then you leave just something very, very small. And uh, so this woman, this as the same woman after falling pregnant, for example, and then she'll have to go, um, 
the, the whole process of pregnancy and birth, and uh, then having to go through this, the, the issues with um with a health practitioner, let's say in Ireland or in Belgium or wherever. And uh, remember, the it's very, very likely that the person who is taking the woman through this process does not come, does not come from the ca culture which practices FGM. So sometimes even the line of questioning itself, it's not even culturally appropriate. And this again tends to throw a woman again. It tends to throw her, detects her again to that dark place when it happened a long time ago. She, so she has to keep on relieving what happened, relieving what happened over and over again. And um, this only was her mental health and uh, so what we have seen what what we have seen and what we are doing in here in Ireland one of the things we have decided to do as a kid and uh, in, a, in a bit to be proactive um, in combating mental health issues which affect women who have gone through FGM on top of fundraising which you've been very, very successful in, um, in getting from individual donors. We have identified black therapists of Ireland. Who, the women who have gone through FGM, they'll be, they, they, they have started going to them and they are being offered counseling, which is culturally appropriate. And the reports we are getting, I can tell you, is that it's very, very positive because the women, they feel they are understood and they are, they are offered that very, very safe space. Mental health, again, when you look at uh, the way things are done and uh, again, being far away from home and being subjected. I remember that slide which, where a woman said that um, even when it came to accessing counseling or a therapist, still she could feel the disconnect. So that means that the space was is not safe. So when you look at even the maternity services, the women women have reported to us that sometimes when they, they've gone to access maternity services, they feel as if they are already in a freak show because of the way they are being treated, their dignity, they feel it is being torn again over and over again. Like what they have gone through is not bad enough. So by working with them um, with 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 cancer with, with counselor, counselors and therapists who are culturally who, who come from a, a background where FGM is understood and where women when they when they enter they can see that there's that representation because the issue of representation is also the other one like a woman enters a service and then who the older she fight there that 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 can also be a setback so we are looking at that and the issue of FGM and the issue of mental health. Because remember again, as we are talking about mental health and FGM, these are women again who are going through a lot of issues and some of which have been very, very well identified in the report which has just been launched. For example, if a woman has gone through FGM and she's in a direct provisional center, that is a center whereby people who come to Ireland, they are put in the center and then they stay there as, um, as they go the process of, of, of getting their papers. If a woman is women who go the, who, who live there and families they have very very few like rights and uh, those who know the the direct provision centers people who are there they are already at the bottom of the heap and then you are a migrant and then you have issues with fgm and then on top of that you the, the services which you're accessing there is very little representation so we are working around that and i wish that um the European network of migrant women, this is something we can take forward uh, through this report to ensure that there's sufficient representation in, in spaces where women go to seek services and especially women, women who have gone through the, the trauma of being subjected to the harmful practice of uh, female genital mutilation. And uh, so I think I'll, I'll stop there. I can see I have finished uh, two minutes early. And uh, because I know I have a feeling I'll be answering more questions uh, from uh, later as we go. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, from this subject of um, female genital mutilation and cultural appropriateness of the services for the women who were victims of this crime and this violence, um, it's logical for us uh, to move into the issue of maternity and motherhood uh, and pregnancy, because in, as a matter of fact, those of us who studied FGM, we all know that this is one of the means to control female sexuality. A lot of this violence is, is related and directed at women because they are women and because uh, they have uh, childbearing capacities. Um, I'm going to pass the floor now to Johanna Shima, who is with the EU delegation of Make Mothers Matter Network, which is an international network advocating for the rights and voices of mothers. Thank you very much, Johanna. 
Thank you, Anna. And I'm going to try to beat Caroline, but I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to be able to be so uh, precise with time. Thank you very much for inviting us, uh, Anna. Um, I would like to start by recalling to everybody the international human rights principles that cover health and especially maternal health care. Um, these are both human rights based on the core principle of dignity. Um, and the right to health is built on the fundamental elements of availability, accessibility, acceptability, and of high quality, the high quality of healthcare. Acceptability is, is, uh, is, the, is what um, means that all health facilities, goods, and services must be respectful of medical, ethics, and cultural appropriate, as well as sensitive and, uh, to gender and life cycle requirements. In Europe, the, uh, the EU has in its priorities of the present commission um, that promoting social and inclusion and combating poverty are core values of uh, our European way of life. And in the 20 principles of the European pillar of social rights, there is a, a principle, the principle 16, that guarantees for everybody the right to timely access to affordable, preventable, and curable, curative health care of good quality. But despite these various international and European legal instruments addressing the right to maternal health care, there are more, uh, many obstacles that remain. The various types of national health systems, the difference in laws and policy within member states, the uh, place vulnerable groups, uh, such as documented migrant women, Roman women, and other minority uh, groups that are at risk, uh, of, they, they put it at risk of not receiving medical care when needed. I'm going to mention six of the, of the main institutional and organizational barriers that we have uh, uh, seen in the of, for women and especially for vulnerable women accessing maternal health care in Europe, which of course affect migrant women in particular. The first barrier is high out of pocket payments. These are payments, these are uh, informal payments that to healthcare professionals in center, Central and Eastern Europe that pregnant women are asked to make. These informal payments seem to be more common in the maternal sector to, due to the planned uh, nature of care and the prolonged contact of, uh, with healthcare professionals. Second, the second barrier that we have seen is the language barriers and the absence of clear policies and information available in various languages uh, leaving uh, migrant women especially uninformed about the procedure to follow. The third barrier is the fear of being deported because, uh, these, uh, because of these migrant women avoid seeking any antenatal care. Uh, we have seen also that there are some uh, countries that are, tried, that are trying to improve the situation, for example, Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, the Netherlands, the Czech Republic, Denmark, and Norway. Um, they prohibit for uh, they, they, there's a provision for healthcare professionals to report the immigration status of the patients. But on the other hand, there are the other countries that I didn't mention that require the healthcare professionals to report the immigration status of their patients. Uh, as a fourth uh, obstacle, we have pointed out that the that those are is the distances to medical facilities. Uh, there is a tendency um, uh, that many rural areas and maternal wards in the rural areas have been closed and merged into larger hospitals in the main cities. This translates uh, into the fact that many women report not having, having had any prenatal care and contact with doctors before the moment of the labor. As a five barrier of obstacles, um, we uh, we have seen and we know about the biases uh, among healthcare professionals and the respect for practices at healthcare facilities. These are reported on a daily basis and includes discriminatory practices, physical abuse, and abandonment. As a sixth barrier, uh, there are disparities in accessing healthcare services that are also influenced by cultural and religious diversity. For example, the studies show that Islamophobia often influence the way Muslim patients, for example, are depicted and how maternity care policies tend to be uh, faith blind. Um, we, have been, uh, we have also been reported of uh, constant discrimination of Roman women seeking maternal care, for example, in the Balkan countries, 
who are often denied services and forced to give birth on their own and are also regularly verbally abused and disrespected by medical professionals. In Bulgaria, for example, it is reported that Roma women are required to bring their own consumables, while other women are not obliged to do that. As analyzed by the Special Rapporteur on uh, uh, Violence Against Women uh, in her report on 2019, to which uh, Make Mother's Mother and, her, and uh, its members and other partners contributed, these respectful uh, acts include disc discriminatory pra practices or procedures, such as unnecessary episiotomies, cesarean procedures that are non-necessary, the use of force, such as dominant pressure, and abandonment that means long delay to be treated and to receive care. So these are the main obstacles that when accessing maternal health care. And how is the maternal mental health? Uh, Make Mothers Matter is, is part of a Euro, uh, European consortium uh, researching peripartum depression. It's a cause action rise up, PPD is called. And this research shows that pregnancy and the first year uh, postpartum that is referred to as the peripartum period, constitute a period of tremendous psychological, physiological, and social changes in women's lives. It is well known and well established that the transition to motherhood increases mental health and the vulnerability to development of mental health disorder in, uh, disorders in women. And the most pre prevalent prepartum mental health uh, problem globally are depression and anxiety. One out of five women will develop a mental illness in the, in the prenatal period, that, uh, that this adversely affects the mother and her overall health, the infant health and the development of the infant, and this drops mother, infant, and family relationships. And furthermore, it puts a strong burden on society as a whole. This is in general the situation for pregnant women, but migrant women, women who are per se in a, if not all, but in a big majority, in a vulnerable situation, present they are separated from the families, they are separated from the countries, they suffer from, uh, from fear of abuse, they lack of, in many occasions of the basic goods to survive. And if one combines all these, uh, so the status of being migrant and the fact of being pregnant, these adverse social, economic, uh, social economy, uh, environmental uh, conditions can negatively impact their mental health by imposing a greater psychological demand in this already uh, vulnerable woman. So for May Mother's Matter, we believe it's a, for a, a, at most importance to shed some light uh, of this specific problem, to be able to accompany better and to provide maternal health care and maternal mental health care to support migrant women. As Roya said, there is there, there are very little research being done in this topic. Um, we have seen and, and, and we consider that some of uh, a good practice and a good way of shedding some light is to also uh, name the good practices that exist because there are some good practices at, at the legislative level, non legislative level. Uh, there are some race awareness, awareness campaigns such as the global campaign that is called the War Maternal Mental Health Day that it was health changes. Every day is around the 5th of May, this year was the 5th of May, uh, uh, and it, it uh, tries to draw attention to the fact that worldwide, 20% of women experience some type of perinatal mood or anxiety disorder, or via as, as projects that are research projects that they wanted as mentioned, the right side PPD, or reports like the present report that uh, uh, where we are talking today uh, at this moment. But let us mention some of the best practices because there are some countries that are trying to improve this. There are some countries like Norway is one of these uh, leaders in uh, an inclusive where uh, uh, pregnant women uh, have the access to prenatal care, care during childbirth, and was unwell as postnatal care and is free of charge, of course. Um, in the Netherlands, the healthcare is very well spread, it's accessible to all people and has a very good uh, geographical coverage. Um, in Germany, for example, every pregnant woman has a statutory right to medical care. In Romania, Romania even though the health coverage is not universal and great social economic inequalities exist and persist, 
there is some progress with the introduction of a plan granting a pregnant woman and postpartum mothers special rights within the social health insurance systems, um, et cetera. I can call and practice in, in Ireland from our member in Ireland where it says that all residents receive a free of charge prenatal maternity care. Spanish tries to give also cars, health cars to uh, migrant women and, pre pre and pregnant migrant women. Um, but there are other countries that are lagging, lagging, lagging behind these, these, uh, these uh, actions. Um, there are some countries that are also trying to uh, do some uh, non-legislative activities to raise awareness. Uh, and this includes lobbying, setting up information points, making information accessible to a wider public, including in different languages. Um, uh, for example, uh, training also uh, hospital staff in uh, intercultural competences, um, or giving this information like uh, via different leaflets, telephone services, hotlines for migrant, uh, in, in migrant uh, languages to migrant people. Um, and a good measure that we have found also is the uh, in Germany, on, in Berlin, in the state, the federal state of Berlin, there is an anonym, anonymized health insurance voucher that, as it says, everybody can use. But um, what I would like to draw the attention is that even though um, we have to consider that Europe is one of the safest regions uh, in the world to give birth. Disparities as the ones that I mentioned and these barriers uh, regarding the safe access to maternal health care uh, persist, not mentioning maternal mental health care uh, between the various member states. And this affect mostly minority groups such as migrant pregnant women, Roma mothers, etc. And therefore we consider, and that's also our, our uh, work at, at Make Mothers Matter, that it's important that we continue advocating for the elimination of these disparities and the discrim and discriminations in our society if we want to construct a better and inclusive world and society. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Johanna, for your uh, contribution and for outlining very uh, generously the, the European context and dif different um, uh, regional differences of which, of course, we're also very aware uh, that only adds to the difficulties of the migrant women um, in different um, parts of the European Union. Um, I'm going to pass the floor to Jennifer Okeke, who is our board member, and she is um, representing uh, our member organization, uh, Immigrant, uh, 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 Immigrant Council of Ireland. And uh, Jennifer is herself is a refugee woman. I think this is also very important to mention, but she is um, a PhD, completing her PhD and um, working with migrant women and on the issues of violence against migrant women uh, with the focus on uh, trafficking. Uh, Jennifer, it's your turn. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, I'm very humbled to be here today. And so I, I just decided I'm gonna do it slightly differently. So I'm a narrative researcher and that simply means we use stories to tell about our experiences or the experience to understand what has happened. And then I decided I'm going to tell you a story today. So a few years ago, I lived in one of those direct provision centers myself or detention centers as they are referred to in some other countries in Europe. And when I lived in one of those places, I lived there with my, with my baby. Every morning you wake up and you ask yourself, why should you get out of bed? Because there was no reason to get out of bed. You don't walk, you don't go to college, you simply wake up, you eat, you go back to bed or to your room. You wake up, you eat again, and then you go back again and you wait for dinner to eat again, and then you go to sleep and the next day and it's the same routine. However, what I did was I kept applying for to colleges, even though I knew I was not allowed to go to college. I just sent out applications to colleges. Eventually, I got one that accepted to take me. Yeah, they were not supposed to, but they did take me, you know. 
And I started college and college saved me. A few months after I was in that direct provision center, I'm a Nigerian woman by origin. Another Nigerian woman went crazy in the place. She went mad, like raving mad. And um, she was taken away. And we never heard anything about her again. But two years of me living in that kind of environment. One of those days, one of the things I remember so well was a Zimbabwean woman that came into the center. I remember her so well because she had this beautiful Afro, beautiful natural Afro that she walked into the center with, with a beautiful smile. And you know, she was one of those women that always had a smile. She, she lived in that place with us for six months or maybe seven months. And one of those days, I came back from college and the woman had gone mad. She just went mad one day and started picking up things from the streets to eat, taking off her clothes. She was taken away as well. And we never saw her again. But two or three years later, I, I was in the main street, uh, you know, the major street in Dublin, or what people call main street in other countries. And, you know, somebody was calling my name, Jennifer. I turned, I, I didn't recognize the person, but I stopped because the person was calling my name. So it means she knows me. I stopped. She walked to me. When she walked to me, she asked about my daughter. I kept trying to remember who is she, you know, and then only when she called her name, I was shocked. I was shocked because she had aged. She no longer looked like herself. It was winter though, and she was walking barefooted. So she was still mad. She was walking barefooted in winter. And I remember because in, it's the major street in Dublin, you know, one of the major streets in O'Connor Street. And I was standing in front of Penny's. I was coming out from the Primark, you know. And I was, I, the shock, I, I still remember how shocked I was because when they took her away, we thought that she would get better. Maybe, you know, they were going to help something and she will get better. But when I saw her two or maybe three years later, in O'Connor Street, I couldn't remember her because she was different from the woman I met in the refugee center. She had aged so much and she hadn't gotten better. She was from Zimbabwe. She wasn't, um, she was probably in her late thirties or early forties, but my main point for telling you the stories that what the regime of Mugabe could not do, which is break her, the direct provision center or the detention center did. That is how bad the place is. She survived Mugabe's regime only to be broken by the detention center. And it is a true life story. So it is, I just told you the stories for you to, to give you an understanding of what the place we are talking about. Because researchers write about this. People have written about it, but there is nothing like living in it. When you, you need to live in it to understand it. You need to live in it to have empathy for people living in that, that kind of life. When migrants come, and it is all of that notion of migrants, they come to pick. But the society often forgets that among that migrants are professional people, that when they left their country for whatever reason that they have left, they were coming to birth a newer and a better version of themselves into their new home, into their environment. They, they come with so much dreams, so much, they are, so much hope, so much wanting to give, but what they meet is chains, shackles put on them. That is what migrant women meet when they come in and live in such centers. It is a very inhuman place. You are put in chains. 
not physical ones, invincible ones, but you are put in chains. When you cannot walk, you are put in chains. When you cannot go to college, even though you want to, you are in chains. When you are told when to eat, when to sleep, when to come back as a grown adult, when you go out, you are in chains, invincible chains. When your children go to school and their, 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 their classmates identifies them as the, they live in that place, those children are traumatized. So when we talk about the trauma of migrant women in those centers, we are also talking about the trauma that gets transferred to the children they, they've given birth to. It is trying to put it in context, trying for us to understand. The level of traumas there are, are ones we can't even begin to understand because people have the notion that you, you, you get accommodation, you get food. You know, you can see the doctor when you're sick. But what makes you, your humanity is taken away from you. The very essence of you is taken away from you. What is left? When we don't, you need to always be in people's shoes to be able to understand them. When we begin to reason it in that way, then maybe we can begin to understand how being put in that place where they are supposedly supposed to be okay becomes a problem, how it impacts on their health. One of the things it also does to migrant women specifically is that it exposes them to further trauma and further danger. I know this because I have lived a life, three years of it. It's also a place where everybody knows, where men know that they can come and get these cheap bodies at a reduced price. Because that is a designated center for men to come and pick up migrant vulnerable women that are broke. I used to live on 31 euros with my daughter. And I have to decide every week when I get 31 euros, am I going to buy the diapers or should I forgo diapers this week and get a yogurt? Or is her clothes, is she outgrowing her clothes? I need to decide. So when women are put in this kind of environment, the level of trauma that it puts them through is one we can be to understand. But it's also one that needs to be addressed because it is trauma. Sometimes trauma that they can't speak about, trauma that they are ashamed to talk about. Because the chains, those invincible chains are chains of shame. I was always ashamed myself to tell people I lived there. Not because I had done something wrong, but because of how they will see me. But these days, I, I, I want to talk about it because that is the only way we will end it. I mean, luckily in Ireland, the government, it, it's, improved, it's improved a bit and the government has promised to bring an end to that kind of center. But I know this kind of center still exists all over Europe and people are trapped there and they are too ashamed to talk about it. And they, they suffer the trauma. They are further re-traumatized in ways we can't even begin to understand. And how do we address this? It is first of all recognizing that that kind of environment is creating the kind of trauma to women and their children. They are stigmatized. And when we talk about mental health, I'm not going to go into mental health, but mental health in certain cultures that we are coming from as migrant women, it's even a taboo to talk about mental health because you don't want anybody to call you crazy. When women come forward to seek help, it is important that people that address these issues are culturally informed. And that is where we need cultural mediators. That is where we need cultural mediation. People that are culturally informed to be able to communicate between the service providers and, and the women that need the help. My point today is for us to understand that migrant women, there are lots of barriers that prevent migrant women in these centers. When migrant women come into the country, they are not coming in to take. 
they're actually coming in with the hope of giving, of giving birth to that newer version of them, of being able to contribute to this new home. But what they meet oftentimes is additional trauma to whatever they, they have left home for. It is important we all understand that it is not easy for people to uproot themselves from everything they know into the unknown because when you're migrating, you're basically walking into the unknown. You don't know what it's gonna bring, but you're hoping for the best. Without cultural mediation, it becomes almost impossible because women will not speak and when they speak, it is important that people that understand them, people that understand the cultural sensitivity, people that understand the stigma attached to mental health, especially for women from certain kind of migrant backgrounds, are brought in to be able to deal with it um, appropriately. And it must, we must always remember that there is no one size fits all. What works for me as a, 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 a Black African Nigerian woman might not work for uh, a woman that is coming from the Philippines. We must not try to fit migrant women into a box, but it is important that we work with cultural mediators to be able to understand what, what is gonna work for this individual woman. Because it is only when we come from that individualistic lens, from that culturally sensitive lens, that we'll be able to address issues of migrant women, specifically for those in the detention centers and for their children as well. We must never forget their children. Thank you. Jennifer, thank you very much. I think we're all a little bit speechless at this point. I know some of us were crying when you were speaking. Um, I'm really very grateful for you sharing this experience, um, lived experience, uh, but also your expert knowledge and and we really value you in the network uh, for this and for who you are and what you bring um there are some questions about whether women are um, tortured in the detention centers but we will move now to the next speaker and maybe you can address it uh, later uh well uh, our next speaker is dr ingeborg kraus who is an expert in trauma. She's a traumatologist and psychologist with a wealth of experience of dealing with women, women who are victims of sexual exploitation, prostitution, and trafficking for its purposes. Um, thank you very much, Ingeborg, for being with us, and uh, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for, especially for this very moving speech of Jennifer Okeke. And I will continue also now with invisible chains and in prostitution. So I will immediately uh, share my slides. Uh, can you see it? Yes, we can see it, but maybe you can make a big screen. Mm -hmm. I can only do it like this at the moment. I don't know why. If you press play, it will not do it. This green, green button on top. Play. On the right, on the right. Yeah, go down. There is this green button. You're uh, right. Yeah. Yes. Ah, oh, okay. That's Perfect. it. So I will focus on prostitution and migrant women, my experience I have in Germany. Oh no, it's not. Oh. So the chance for a girl to become victim of sexual exploitation is approximately 20% worldwide. This hasn't changed with the years. The VHO report from 2021 indicates that one out of three girls and young women have suffered from some form of sexual contact. So actually it is increasing. Germany indicates the same number. So sexual violence against 
women and girls go through all social classes and are not depending on the economical situation of a country. Uh, women in prostitution show a higher rate of pre-traumatization. So here I have listed six studies who have been done independently who are showing that the pre-traumatization is even higher. Uh, so why is it like this? Because repeated trauma does something with you. So you can develop a deep feeling of worthlessness uh, if you don't feel valuable. Uh, the entrance into prostitution is easier. So the trust in people and relationship is deeper sh shaken on limits are not known. I will not uh, tell you now everything what uh, uh, repeated trauma can do with you but also dissociation is uh, very common. And that's why uh, when, people, uh, when women get attacked, they throw the, sometimes they don't you know, uh, defend themselves. And that's why the re re victimization is very high. Um, exactly. Today, 95% of the women in prostitution in Germany are migrant women. As those women have special vulnerabilities. So I will not repeat everything that has been said before, uh, but they are, are often alone. They have left their families behind them. They come from a different language. The culture is different. They experience, experience discrimination in the new country. They don't know their rights. Uh, sometimes they have uh, no profession, uh, mainly they are young. Um, they don't know their rights. They come from a country perhaps where women's rights are not respected. Uh, they are poor. They have perhaps de debts, uh, dependency, uh, also the illegal status and fear of the police is uh, yeah, very common. And as I said, pre-traumatization, uh, they have experience in their country or on the way they flight to the country. And this makes it, um, yes, um, make it a, a high risk for them to get in the trauma, into a trauma bond. So what is a trauma bond? The victim establishes a traumatic bond to a perpetrator. So like their own family, you know, can send, can send them into prostitution in Germany to send them uh, money. They sacrifice one daughter. This is unfortunately very common here in Germany. Or they establish family-like relationships to a person that promises them a better future because they're isolated, they don't know any, anybody else. Or the lover boy metal trafficker, which makes 10% of the trafficked women in a prostitution. Um, in the Palermo Protocol from 2011, which is the, the guideline for all European countries to adopt for the fight against human trafficking, the definition of human trafficking includes scam, fraud, abuse of power, and exploitation of special vulnerabilities. So you don't need physical violence to commit human trafficking or false prostitution. The abuse of power can take place when the person feels compelled to accept the exploitation. In a context, where prostitution is seen as a job as any other, like in Germany, those special vulnerabilities of migrant women are not taken into account, but are even qualifications to enter into prostitution. With this law we have in Germany, we are not only shutting down, down our eyes towards the criminal offenses that are listed in the Palermo Protocol, we are even seeing prostitution as a solution for those special vulnerabilities. Women told me very often who are in prostitution that they have been told, well, you can be happy that you have work here in Germany. Prostitution is seen as an option against poverty, unfortunately. So a law that legalizes prostitution is a push factor for trafficking in women. It brings women into prostitution. In, 19, in 2019, the Federal Criminal Police Office has recorded only 287 legal proceedings of trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation. 
and has detected 427 victims. So this is the little uh, on the left side, the detected uh, uh, women. Helmut Sporer police a man who worked over 25 years as a head of the anti-trafficking resort in Augsburg says that we have a minimum of 100,000 women, mostly women who are victim of human trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation. So 500 to 1,000 times more than recognized by the police. So the police goes into the brothers uh, to make their usual controls and ask the women if everything is all right, and they say yes. Even if almost of all those, those women are trafficked. The police became blind towards the mechanism of trafficking. They have the wrong picture of how a woman looks like. Uh, they think, you know, they have to look for metal change. A, a woman running to, towards them and screaming. In most of the cases, the woman is silenced and has a mental change, change that keeps her in the exploitation. And this is important to understand. Yeah. Severe human rights crimes don't take place loudly, but in silence. Therefore, women in prostitution have a, a rate of PTSD that is more as double as high as soldiers coming back from war. So I have listed here on only five studies. There are even more. Uh, severe, um, yeah. And uh, this, I made a slide here to show what kind of influences the trafficked women are exposed in Germany. The state and the society doesn't speak out the harm of prostitution. They see prostitution as work. And when a state doesn't name violence as violence, then you normalize violence in society. A pathology is normalized. The police has developed almost no skills to identify the victim. The trafficked women stay undetected and are perceived as workers. There is no justice. The great majority of the perpetrators remain unpunished. The trafficked women live in an environment where they know they have they will find no justice. In the last 20 years, Germany has not developed helping structures that help the women to exit prostitution. In every bigger town, they have counseling officers for prostitute, prostitutes, but they help, just help women to remain into prostitution and not to exit. And of course, so, they are also part of the system that downplays the harm. And many towns, in many towns, they even cooperate with the bottle keepers. And of course, the victim's vulnerability is not seen. Poverty, her age, or schooling, not speaking the language isolation, and so on. It is nearly impossible to escape this system. And if you can't escape physically, then you have to escape by your mind. You dissociate from your body. What you have in German brothels are bodies who are dissociated from the person. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ingeborg. It's difficult to add anything here. Um, I think it's, it's so crucial that we keep being reminded of the reality of prostitution which we recognize as a network, as a form of violence against women, and um, keep being reminded of the fact that those countries who legalized it as, a, as an occupation contribute to very serious human rights violation. And um, it, it includes violence and murder, but, but uh, undoubtedly uh, it includes deterioration of well-being and, and health and mental health of those women, majority of whom are migrant women, are trapped in this so-called industry. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to pass the floor to Natasha Narin, who is uh, one of the founding members of the Young Women Collective in our network, Radical Girls. Uh, they have their own website and their own social media, and uh, Natasha has also contributed to this report very generously. And uh, she's going to speak about the experiences of uh, young migrant women and girls. Thank you, Natasha. 
Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. First of all, it was really great um, to be able to uh, be part of this report, which is quite unique. I really think that um, we need to have a lot more of uh, similar documentation because uh, firstly, women's mental health is uh, out of the scenario of any type of uh, political um, setup. But then on the top of that, migrant mental health issues are totally ignored and mostly um, psychologists are not even trained for um, women's migrant women's issues specifically. I am 27 years old and um, I have lived in Italy for almost 13 years now, actually. And uh, the experience of migration has caused me so much distress that um, I, have, I have been totally unable to do anything in my life from studies to work to so many other things, social interaction or everything that I liked, it was taken away. So uh, I think this is the uh, journey of most migrant young girls. Um, they are taken away and like uh, they come here or they're taken away um, from their homeland into a world which is very unfamiliar to them. And the process of learning slash unlearning, it's extremely painful and the isolation plays a huge role, um, which is never considered important. So this, this is the same thing that happened to me, but again, uh, it's not just one story, definitely like uh, we have seen in the report, many, many um, young girls, they, they go through the same thing. So uh, coming to Italy, it has been painful just because I had to leave all the family and friends behind. But also as a young girl, you know, you, you have cute dreams of, you know, having friends and taking ice cream or um, talking about girls and boys in the school and everything. But not being able to do that at, um, as a teenager, it, it kind of start disturbing you and that disturbance start becoming a mental illness from one day to another and you are, you're not able to process it. And when you ask help to your uh, family doctor, uh, I was told that, you know, just give it the time, it's gonna be okay. Um, take painkillers uh, because uh, I used to have a lot of headache and stuff, uh, not related to my physical health, but it was very much related to mental health, but I was never taken seriously. And after, 10 years of being in Italy, I finally found one psychologist who have had uh, special studies in uh, migration, the, the whole process, and then I was able to find help. But not everybody is able to do that because with, with, with the social exclusion uh, that I, uh, I, do, I do not know the whole society, the, whole, the culture, I was found in. Then on the top of that, in school, all the friendships or the social relationships that a young girl needs to, you know, make in order to feel normal, um, that was taken away because uh, with all the confusion of trying to understand your surroundings, you are lost in your own world. And while the world you are found in, it does not take you seriously. And, this is how the process of bullying somehow starts. It starts from uh, your um, uh, your costume you are wearing, your uh, cultural dress, which is your representation. But when it's it, it's been mocked uh, um, just for existing, you are being mocked just for being who you are. You start questioning and hating not only a part of your identity, but your whole history, whoever you are, it becomes questionable and painful. And so on, so forth, there are like so many different levels of pain that young girls go through. And 
there are there is never enough help for 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 the young girls and um uh, i think this is this is what we need to tackle and this is the first step this report is one of the first steps that we we need to take that was you know long due that we need to talk about it that these are the issues that are enabling young girls to uh, find uh, freedom in their situations because normally what happens is that uh, a lot of my friends at the age of 16 to 18 they left schools because they did not find enough help or they did not feel like this is the place where they belong and now they are somewhere in the world definitely not happy in their marriages uh, in their homes where they're just existing doing nothing so instead of having being helped and taken out of their isolation, mental isolation, physical isolation, uh, it could have been, you know, way better. I, 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 uh, I think like as um, the, as migrant women, we are not taken very much seriously. As migrant young women, uh, we are not on the priority radar of any institution in. In, uh, within Europe, but also within uh, singular countries like in Italy. Uh, the more young girls I, I, I talk with, the more I feel their pain as a collective pain that's being ignored constantly. Um, and the, uh, the stunning part is the similarities of the behavior of bullism in the school or uh, the social exclusion just because of their way of dressing, just because of mm, their you know um, religious background, their ethnic background, it's all a uh, huge part. Whereas um, the solution uh, to this has, uh, for me, it has been um, finding more um, uh, women uh, NGOs in Italy, but also Finding an you know, uh, European network of migrant women have been a huge help. Knowing that you're not alone, it's it's the biggest help you can find. I think in the beginning, uh, which doesn't cost anything. I think, uh, and it gives you a lot of input. It it gives you energy that you need to you know move on and process the trauma of migration, of social exclusion, of uh, having nobody on your side um, then radical girls was one of the things that helped me a lot that is helping me a lot um, and this is the motive of I think radical girls uh, as well to have that solidarity that sisterhood that does not limit you to uh, your ethnicity your religious background your just but your uh, biographical history or whatever you have done it's right now all of us in it together supporting each other um so similar uh, systems they definitely work in order for uh, young women to feel okay with themselves but uh, similar solutions need to be uh, m much more present not just some uh, small group like ours um, there needs to be a lot more so yeah, that's that that's kind of it, I think, uh, from my side. Um, so thank you very much, um, European Network of Migrant Women, Radical Girls for existing, for giving me this platform, all these young um, girls and that I, I am part of this group. They are um, the courage you know I, I need it and I think um, a lot of uh, a lot more young girls would be benefiting from it uh, in future definitely thank you thank you Natasha uh, we of course equally benefit from the presence of young women and, and radical girls as a network and I can say personally I lot I learned a lot from from the young women with whom we are working very closely um, there probably will be some questions later. Uh, we are going to now complete the presentations with the final speaker, Drisha Fernandez, who is uh, herself right now in Colombia. She's speaking from Colombia and she, she's an anthropologist, but also has 
um, experience of work uh, with women in post-conflict situations and migrant women, refugee women, um, women who were subjected to severe and multiple uh, forms of violence. Uh, Drisha will share with us a little bit about some methodology that she's in the process of developing right now. Thank you, Trisha. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, all these wonderful speakers. I do uh, believe that Inom is leading the way in key fights for women worldwide. Their team, their young team of, of, of women and contacts all over the world, I really congratulate you for what you're doing. I come from a country that has been 50 years in armed conflict. And we currently, for the last maybe 15 years, we have experienced one of the largest migrations um, uh, worldwide, which is from the social political crisis in Venezuela. We are talking about at least 4 million Venezuelans in Colombia. And we believe that of those, um, at least 800, uh, the 400,000 women could be uh, exploited in prostitution. Um, my presentation, of course, there are experts before me, Ingeborg, and a lot of people who, who have much more expertise that we are trying to bring hope. And hope means all of you who are here and all of us who know we need to do much more for women and we need to um, learn from science, from science and from experience too on what works. So if you can see my presentation right now, um, I will try to be quick. Let me see, 11, 18, okay. So, um, to start with, I would like to ask the question, if all we, when we speak about migrant women, are they all really migrants? Because um, migrants are supposed to leave their country to look for better opportunities, but they have protections at home. So when we ask this question is to really understand under international law, if they are just migrants or there are other crimes that these women and girls are experiencing and that we should presume. Do they have options at home? If they don't have options or protection at home, they're not really migrants. We need to presume grave human rights violations. And grave human rights violations include rape and torture. I can tell you from a country in armed conflict that this is very common. Forceful di displacement, trafficking for prostitution and other forms of sexual exploitation, or seeking asylum or refugee status because of political issues. So when we speak or work with migrant women, always my, my uh, suggestion is organizations, um, officers, et cetera, should presume grave human rights violations. It's not just somebody who's coming to find a better opportunity. It is someone who has lived very serious uh, human rights violations in their hometown. CEDO uh, General Recommendation 38 was excellent in really getting into the structural causes of many of these victimizations for migrant women, socioeconomic injustice at home, discrimination in migration and asylum regimes, demand that fosters exploitation of women and girls, situations of conflict and humanitarian emergencies, and the use of technology in trafficking. Um, the most vulnerable women and girls are the victims of many of these different crimes worldwide. So we should assume also that they have suffered traumatization. I mean, this is not something you elect. It's usually uh, some, an experience that they have had at home, during, on the way, and maybe even in the new place where they arrive. Understanding trauma, Ingeborg is the expert, but I will just go very quickly into trauma is something that is, is supposed to be there to help us to survive. Flight, fight, or freeze is when we have the tiger is usually the, the, the explanation people give on what trauma is, is this, your brain gets into a mode in which you are able to survive and choose one of these three. Traumatization on the other side is when a trauma is re-experienced, it gets more fixed in the brain and it is experienced and codified permanently. And this is going to have really 
terrible effects in the lives of women and girls. And, and I mean, I'm speaking about women and girls in this presentation. We, they, it has been called complex, well, post-traumatic stress disorder is how um, uh, scientists call it. Uh, we wouldn't call it post for women in prostitution because it, it happens continuously and it is complex. We have another uh, colleague who calls it perpetuating traumatic stress defend, defense to give it a positive outlook to say traumatization or trauma is helping you to survive. To survive, And we need to find the way in which it doesn't interfere in your daily life. The elements of traumatization are four, a, a specific event, a meaning that is given to that event, the brain panorama, and the perception or impos of impossibility to escape. We have, you have been part witness or somebody tells us about this event, a meaning that has been learned by the person, or, and it obviously this meaning depends on our level of attachment or threat of loss. Possible losses are physical, personal, and public. Okay, if we look at all of these, we can, I mean, there's a long list for migrant women. Other, another element of trauma, and I'm gonna concentrate on this one, is the brain panorama. So all the inherent temperament, sensitivity towards stress generators and previous and current experiences. So we have, uh, there's a, a big study in the United States in 2015 that speaks about adverse childhood experiences, and we can see abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction that are there as pre, um, uh, you can evaluate, uh, they will produce traumatization in the person. The brain panorama could be vulnerable or could be resilient. So vulnerable person would be, ex for example, excessive empathy, low self-esteem, difficulties with emotional regulation, acute stress, chronic stress, and context stress. These are all situations in which many migrant women live. Resilient panorama would be good intellectual functioning, adequate attachment, active problem solving, and sensation of being understood and, um, and their needs are moderate. And then the fourth element of traumatization is the perception that it is impossible to escape. So you have all these different ways of describing as a traumatization. And I think in Jennifer's experience, I mean, this is exactly how we all felt and probably how she felt and probably how uh, this person that she described also felt. Um, as Ingeborg explained, um, traumatization is, is basically the protection mechanism that is used is dissociation, which is disconnecting your body from your mind. And also, well, the compulsion to repeat, to gives you an idea that you can dominate the situation and you generate a whole lot of other issues next to it. Phobia, somatization, depressions, disorders, et cetera, addictions. So you have a person that could be defensive and irritable, energized with risk. And on the other side, you have a person who has feels anesthesia or emotional paralysis. And this is what makes it a real challenge to work with traumatized people, because sometimes you're gonna be on one corner and sometimes you're gonna be in the other. The effects of traumatization are huge in the, it basically interferes in all the basic functions of the human being generating internal signals to register what you need, create a map on how to solve these needs, generate the energy to get it solved, warn on the dangers and opportunities and adjust to the situations and of the moment. So many times when we work with women, we're like, but I'm giving you the opportunity. Trust me, I have all this to offer you and they will not trust you. They prefer to trust the pimp, which is solving many of all the situations that they consider key to survive. What we can say is basically pimps and traffickers are experts on post-traumatic stress disorder. They know how to make themselves indispensable. They will cover for all those needs of a traumatized person. And on top of that, they will generate a profit from it. So what have we learned from science? From neuroscience, we know the impact of trauma in the brain and in the reaction of the amygdala. From epigenetics, we have learned about a predisposition for trauma and intergenerational trauma. So we have mother, grandmothers, mothers, and daughters in, uh, who are traumatized or, for example, exploited in prostitution. 
pharmacology has taught us that it helps to block the dopamine system, but you no, know, so the person is more or less there, but it interferes in many other feelings like motivation, uh, happiness, uh, sharing, et cetera, et cetera. And it does not solve the underlying causes of the trauma. Psychotherapy has many limitations and it can re-traumatize uh, the person who's traumatized if that person is not in a safe place. Talking about the trauma, you're reliving it and it makes it worse. So science has taken us, has we, I mean, a lot of what work had been done with psychotherapy, um, then a lot of psychopharmatherapy, and now the new thing, not the new thing, because this has been happening in many different cultures, is psychosensory. Psychosensory techniques and therapies are the ones that seem to work the best because they combine the brain, the emotions, and the body. So if we see this kintsugi, you know this, this art, you know, Japanese art, in which you are broken into pieces, but you are able to put them together and make that part of your life. It's not about erasing what you have lived. There is no explanation to a rape, to a, a series of things. It's not the person's fault, but it's really about living with that. So the challenge for all of us who work with traumatized people is not to accept those terrible events, but to dominate the internal and overwhelming sensations and emotions it produces and unable you to go on with your life. It is very important that women participate in their own healing process. And we have the hypothesis that if the mother heals, she can protect and heal her children. If we don't think of the women as mothers, and I mean, the, the whole trafficking and prostitution system also makes a profit of the children of the women in prostitution or having women have children that is useful for them too. So we go into the solutions. Many cultures have developed techniques to strengthen physical, mental, and emotional resilience. Others are being designed and practiced recently, mostly for veterans of war. Little has been done for women. So what we need to do is network and strengthen the experiences and what works out of these for women and girls. Psychosensory techniques, what they do is they uh, uh, help observe oneself and integrate traumatic memories, find a way to be serene and focused, be calm when thoughts, images, and physical sensations remind you from the past, find a way to be alive and connect with those around you, to not keep those secrets from yourself, including those which allowed you for survivor, survival, like killing somebody, for example, or doing things that could be considered terrible, but that helped you survive, or leaving your children abandoned, confront them later in a safe place. That we need to, that traumatized people need to feel a wide variety of emotions. The truth is traumatized women, for example, only feel fear and all the different ones connected to fear because that will help them uh, uh, protect themselves or anger to cope with a situation. But the, all those other wonderful experiences, joyful, peaceful, sad, sadness, for example, are not uh, experienced by traumatized persons because they're in survival mode. Uh, what techniques do we have? Movement and representation techniques. In Africa, for example, we could not understand how, um, at least in the United States, African uh, cultures have survived and been resilient to slavery if it wasn't for rhythm, song, dance, theater, a lot of art therapy, then we have Tai Chi, Qi Kong, and martial arts are also used as techniques. They stimulate the connection with oneself, with others. They generate social synchrony, communal rhythms, happiness, exploration, and reciprocity. Other key uh, psychosensory techniques are yoga and meditation. They stimulate and regulate breathing and heartbeats, capacity to manage tension and relaxation, listen to the body, look within and feel the changes as transitory experiences, not something that's going to be there forever. So you are able to say, I can manage this. I will do my breathing and I will get through this uh, panic attack or this anxiety attack. Another one is positive programming. So we have neurofeedback, havening techniques, 
mindfulness, and others that help program the brain with positive thoughts, resilience, and install optimism and hope. Other, these are non-specific uh, techniques. Now we go to the specific techniques. Specific techniques that have proven to be very useful for women are massages, for example, craniosacral therapy, Feldenkrais, acupuncture, reflexology, emotional um, uh, freedom technique, Reiki, uh, aromatherapy, grounding, etc. What they do is they stimulate the connection with the self to experience relaxation and reduce somatization of trauma and pain. We have EMDR and tapping, uh, eye movement uh, reprocessing technique and tapping, which allows to observe experiences and reorganize those in order to interpret reality. It takes care of irrelevant material in the brain, just like the deep sleep does. So you will see traumatized people usually don't sleep well. They don't get into the REM mode, which is the one that reprocesses all the memories and gets rid of the ones that you don't need. And, and you will be able to, to really rest and have a fruitful day on the next day. And then we have the havening techniques, which are like the most recent, um, which is a new technique um, that, in which that has been studied and produces delta waves. And those delta waves alter the chemistry of the brain, cutting the connection between the emotion and the memory. And this is very simple technique. It's beautiful. It's very uh, based on women's touch, basically, a motherly touch. So I very uh, much recommend uh, havening techniques to work specific uh, trauma traumatic events in the life of people, of women and girls. Other key holistic practices have to do with strengthening the health of the brain. You cannot just do a technique, but you need to sleep well, eat well, I mean, balanced food, complement with vitamins and minerals, good physical activity to balance the brain and burn toxins, and, rece and reception of delta waves in, that are present in nature, in music, in art, and in fun activities. Also, spiritual and social strengthening. These are practices that offer a feeling of belonging, a purpose of life, and create a network of support, which is very important, especially for migrant women who are, are completely separated from their networks of support at home. Empowerment derived from political advocacy and networking also helps give a meaning to that suffering and the possibility to help others and a sense of purpose in their lives. Um, the uh, suggestion for all of us is the more techniques we learn, the better. As uh, Jennifer said it too, each woman needs something different. Some techniques work in some women, some don't. Um, each woman is a whole new world. I mean, we cannot, we cannot have one solution for all the women. Every woman is, there is unique. And that is not easy to do in programs and government led programs. I mean, because it needs a lot of empathy and you also need a wider network of support. The hypothesis that we have in the work we are doing in Colombia is that if organizations working with all these different types of traumatization concentrate on healing, it will improve all other initiatives that lead, uh, I mean, for these women to lead a life away from their victimization or a prostitutional system that is using them. So finding a job, uh, getting educated, I mean, all these other things women have to do if you don't heal first, or if you don't start that, start that process first, you will not be able to continue your life or rebuild your life. The challenges are enormous, because, I mean, this was explained by Ingeborg, leaving the prostitutional and the debt system is pretty much impossible. Rescuing women from criminal networks, disconnecting them from their families who are usually or many times part of the prostitutional system. They push them there. Leaving their apparent ego retributions from the sex buyer attention, sex buyers, I mean, having a safe place living in uncertainty or living with other women. It is incredible, but some women prefer the prostitutional system because it solves their, all their apparent needs. And when they offer them something new, they're more scared of that than of leaving the pips. 
having a committed and emotionally strong team to work with them, understanding trauma and traumatized women is very difficult. Having the patience, not being dominating with these with the women, it's very, very challenging. Prioritizing and meeting all their external needs and their children's needs too. Trusting themselves, the idea that women deserve to heal. They deserve that opportunity. Many of them don't think they deserve it and to start new ways of life and understanding how to protect their children is another of the huge challenges. So just to end, I would like to say that all of this work can be done. It is not easy. You need resources, but sometimes they're cheaper even than going to a, the, the health system. Um, but we need to work on the structural causes. We don't want more women entering the prostitution system already with the ones that are there. We have huge challenges. So we do need as the women's movement worldwide to work on socioeconomic justice for women and girls at home, promote safe migration frameworks, discourage the demand that fosters prostitution, confront uh, conflict and humanitarian crisis situations, and finally, combat digital technology in trafficking. So these are huge challenges. If we don't work on this, we will have more and more women that we will need to heal. And of course, the healing process is very complex. Thank you very much. Thank you, Drisha. Thank you for uh, finishing this presentation with the other. Uh, not at all ambitious plan for all of us to change all of those systems. We are right now as the net still engaged in um, this what's happening in Afghanistan with Afghan women and everything what you were saying resonates with me personally, I'm sure with other women in our network, uh, the trauma with which we deal every day uh, from the women. And of course, Afghanistan is just one example. Um, it is so overwhelming and it is so enormous. Um, and uh, I call the speakers mentioned this, um, that the support networks, the sense of connection, the sense of there is somebody who will hear you, who will maybe doesn't, it's not just about immediate help, it's just about a presence of another woman who uh, who is there to know that you are in trouble, that you are suffering, that you are in danger. Um, I, I, it uh, it uh, makes, I wouldn't say miracles, they're not miracles, but but we see this those um, uh, expressions that women are giving to us when they when they find another woman on another end of the world who cares. And I think this is uh, one of the messages of building those networks. Uh, thank you, Drisha, very much for showing all of these techniques. Uh, um, thank you to all the presenters for sharing your expertise. I want to say that for us, um, we wrote the report. We, we captured the opinions and words uh, of many women who are either themselves migrant women or experts who work with migrant women. Issues are multiple. Uh, we don't want this to end with just another publication and people will read it and will, they will say, oh, well, its situation is quite bad for migrant women, we understand. Um, we really want to take it to the next level. That's why we finished this presentation with Drisha's uh, kind of methodology, because this is what we want to do next. Uh, and um, we invite if anyone who is watching us on Facebook or, or, or watched later that if you want to contribute methodologically to uh, building um, another step uh, in our journey of supporting migrant women uh, healing, uh, please get in touch with us. Um, we have a couple of questions. I also have personal questions to some of the speakers. Um, there is a question for Jennifer. Uh, if women who are in direct provision in those detention centers that you described, Jennifer, uh, if they're also subjected to actual uh, torture um, and how this may contribute, I mean, obviously it does, but if you have some examples on, on, or, thank you. Um, thanks, uh, thank you, Anna. Um, I suppose it, de it, defi uh, it depends on what we see as torture. Torture to one person might be um, it's, I, I think it's um, subjective. 
um, because um, some of the things they do there will be considered torture. While it's not physical torture, um, there are things that another human being we do to somebody else that becomes very inhuman, you know, and might be described as torture. Um, I'll give you an example for a, for instance. Um, the one I lived in, which was a very bad one, and I, I would like to note that it's not all of them that were all of the centers was as bad as mine. Some were better. It depends on the manager, and that is again where you see power at play because it's 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 that sense of having power over other human beings as well. You see people want to exercise the power they think they have over you because you are a migrant individual. Um, we have times when in most of the centers, there used to be time for, times for you to eat, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And if you miss either of them, that is it. You have to, and because for example, I myself, I go to college at that time I was, Lucky enough that I saw a college that accepted me to come. I had to leave the, the center very early. But even, <laughs> even when I asked for maybe, can I have two slices of bread to go to college with? They tell me, no, it's not your time to, for the canteen to open. You have to wait, stuff like that. So it means I, I go to school without breakfast. And of course I don't have money. And then I don't eat lunch because I can't buy food in the canteen again because in school, because I don't have money. So while I was in college, all I ate was dinner. And I also developed ulcer, stomach ulcer while I was in the center because I don't have breakfast because I can't have it. The canteen has not opened. By the time I get back, lunch is over. So I always eat dinner. And that was also the same for some people. There are small things, small things that are meant to be irrelevant for human, for one human being to another. But you ask for those little things, something like, can I get a toilet paper? And they'll tell you, oh, you were given one last week. What did you do with it? Or can I have a glass of juice? Oh, do you see this much juice in your country? You know, those kind of inhuman treatments to another human being. Those are the kind of treatment that people get in some of these um, centers that, you know, you see a lot of people because of that level of dehumanization, that level of shame being put on you. Some people don't even bother to come for this food. And that is just an example I'm giving. There is nothing like hope. What that place does to you is that it takes away hope. It takes away hope. Because when you're coming to a different country, you don't know what you're going to come into, but you're hoping, you have hope. It's that hope that drives people sometimes as a migrant. And when somebody takes away hope from you, what more is left? So, I mean, for me, torture is it's, it's very subjective. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Um, we have a question to Caroline and Akidwa. Uh, why organizations such as Akidwa do not get enough resources and support from the government to enable and uh, support migrant women? And how organization could come together? I guess this is more for the Irish context, but it would also be applicable to other countries where there is a similar system of direct provision, which is basically prisons for, for uh, those who are waiting their asylum applications. So how organizations could come together and solve the problem of women in direct provision? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Anna, for that good question. And um, yeah, like why there is not much support for organizations like Akidwa. Uh, this morning, Salome and I, we were in another meeting and uh, the same question came up. And uh, I remember we we're trying to say, you know, just like the constituents who we serve, who are the migrant women. And then we also touched on the issue of unconscious bias. That the same treatment, which is accorded to migrants. Sometimes it's also extended to organizations uh, like Akidwa who are burning the, the, the midnight oil um, to work on issues affecting migrants. And so 
so what I'm trying to say is sometimes organizations like us, like we have to work very, very, very hard to be taken seriously. And um, that is something we try to do. And uh, so we can say that sometimes we know that there is plenty of what I like calling systemic discrimination um, against, against migrants, just like what Jennifer said when, when referring to torture, but it is not direct. You do not say that someone took your finger and put it, uh, put it in, in, fed, fed it to the door, but your rights may be to food, to good hygiene, they'll be that those will be taken away. So it's the same thing even with organizations like Akidwa and other migrant-led organizations who do a lot of work. And um, and, and, and no matter how much noise we make, uh, the, the funding, uh, we do not get uh, like the, uh, enough, enough support, mostly in terms of funding, so that we can be able to, to, to help uh, as, as many migrant women as possible or as we would love to. And um, so anyway, so like it's about that. Uh, I, I think the bottom line or in a nutshell is about systemic discrimination and unconscious bias against people like us and uh, not being taken seriously. Again, the same issues which we see uh, affecting um, the women are those also like some sometimes the same ones which are extended to us or are projected towards us, and uh, we are doing what we can to yeah to to see, to, to, to move forward. And uh, yeah, thank you for that good question. So a lot needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. We have another question, which I'm not sure I understand very well. And somebody who wrote it, Carla, she, I think it's uh, English is not her native language. I'm going to read it. Um, she says, uh, I want to know how you get a good acculturation when the women's support is low. Um, I guess if I understand the question correctly, is that in the context that we are describing with a, with a lack of uh, culturally appropriate services for migrant women, um, how, how, do we, how do we get women to um, be integrated in, a, in a, their new home countries and, and be functional in the new society? I do not know if anybody wants to address it. Yes, I think I'll take that away. I'll try to to say something like, "How do you get um, acculturated?" And I understand the process of acculturation. It's also a, it's also a very very long process because culture is dynamic. It's not um, it's it's not static, and so that means that this person might be struggling to become part and parcel of the country she's chosen, and uh, when the support is low, again, this is taking us to a, to, the, to a space of cultural competency which um and, and I think it's also maybe what what Jennifer called a uh, cultural mediation whereby there is that um lack of understanding of the other of each other and uh, so when the support is low I think what we need to do is to have as many organizations as possible putting in themselves into that space of supporting people who are new and also supporting other indigenous organizations and indigenous people so that they can understand the other and be open for the other but there's a lot of work again to be done in that uh, so, so that people can be able but because I also understand acculturation as a process of learning, whereby there will be mutual learning. Like uh, if it's Caroline, I'm in Ireland. I want to learn what it is, what is it about um, my, my country, and maybe and and also hoping that they also want to know what is Caroline bringing uh, to the table. So it's also about that, and uh, so. When the support is low, that's another issue. And so again, that's again leads us to that space of a lot of work to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. Well, maybe I can also add uh, from our experience as a as a network. I do not know if there is such a thing as acculturation. Um, I think that it's extremely dangerous to push women into any kind of uh, forced scenarios, cultural scenarios when they're not ready for it. Um, it can really backfire both uh, mentally and psychologically but also in terms of um, you know when we help women to overcome uh, the situations of violence if they're with violent partners for example uh, on the other hand on the other hand there is the issue of cultural relativism where 
you know, we kind of abandon the universal principle of human rights. And we say, oh, yeah, well, forced marriage is okay for this community because they practice it in their country. Or, or you know, female genital mutilation, yeah, it's bad, but okay, they're doing it because they're different. I heard, um, uh, literally, I was told by some police officers, actually persons from the army who are guarding the camps of refugees, when I asked, how do you deal with domestic violence in the camp? And they said, uh, well, there's, there's, it doesn't really happen. And I said, are you sure? Uh, I mean, it happens everywhere. We know this. And they said, well, if they scream and if they, if they, if they beat them so badly that we hear it, then we, we, we help. But you know what? This is their culture. This is what they do to women. And, and I mean, this is another side of this when, when we confuse or the people who work with, with migrants, they confuse uh, the cultural you know, acceptance um, tolerance, if you want to call it, an understanding with uh, disrespect to the basic fundamental rights of women and understanding that it is, it is abuse, abuse and abuse and violence is, is violence. Um, and the, the, the answer to this, in our opinion, is we need what everybody was talking about, those cultural mediators. I want to emphasize that cultural mediation in our view has to be done from women's rights perspective, because there are sometimes such cultural mediators that, you know, sometimes they put an interpreter who is belonging to the, who belongs to the community where perpetrator comes from. And in this case, it becomes, this mediation becomes meaningless. And this is just one, one example. Um, so yes, it's direct engagement with women, with migrant women, listening to them, listening to their stories and taking them very seriously. I think Frohar wants to add something here and Drisha as well. Yes, uh, yes, I want to add something that uh, comes from the report. I don't think uh, acculturation is a way forward. A lot of people, experts, uh, migrant women talked about um, the practitioners, the uh, the social workers, understanding them. So it should be a two-way process, not uh, making one person to acculturate or understand about the host culture, but the host culture should also start learning and understanding the culture of other migrants or other people coming to their countries. So it's it's a two-way process. And what was lacking, and it comes over and over in the report, is that a lot of mental uh, work professionals didn't understand the cultural background or didn't even un understand where these women were coming from. So when they talked about what was going on um, with them, the, the practitioner really didn't understand than what, what they were saying and they were questioning them in a different way or they, they they like like I gave you the quote they were already had an answer in their head and they were expecting the woman to say what they were expecting to to be said so um so it's it's uh, it's not so much acculturation it's, it's a, it should be more like a two-way process of understanding each other not just one the migrant woman uh understanding the host community culture that should that that's happening naturally anyway but the host community also should learn about the migrants uh, cultures or backgrounds especially the professionals uh, who are dealing with migrant women or migrants Drisha uh, yes, I agree, Rohan. I think there are many challenges there um, and I, I think there's I mean, one of the continents with more cultural diversity could be Europe. I mean, there's there's no doubt. I mean, languages, uh, customs, I mean, a series of things, even if it's a lot of the Western culture, it does have a lot of diversity. As an anthropologist, I could say that um, cultural mediation is important, but what has made the difference, at least in my life, is a human rights perspective, human rights framework because you can have and you will want people to share their cultures and we can learn from yours and you can learn from ours and etc cetera, etc cetera. and that is all nice when there is equality that is all nice when we all have the same opportunities but when there is a power relationship 
when some are wealthier than the others, when are politically, economically, et cetera, wealthier than others, of course, the other culture, even if it's super rich, has a lot to offer, nobody will listen to them. So I think we have to have a minimum standard. The human rights framework gives us minimum standards and it's going to ask this from everybody, you know, from the powerful, from the ones who are receiving and from the ones who are arriving. I think we need more people who do field work, less on their desks, more on the field. If they can even go to the origin countries and have a see and a feeling of where these women and people come from, that I think is going to help a lot. A lot of connection with people on the ground. Conversation, communication has to be in the same language. I mean, people, we have understood that people will understand change when it comes first in your mother language, in the language that is close to your heart. That will generate change. If you want somebody to change and you're talking to them in English and it's not their mother language, it's very difficult. And we are not saying that migrant people shouldn't learn English. We're saying, if you want the change, start with the mother language, and then the person will open up and will learn the good things of the other culture. Okay. Um, I think those would be my suggestions for this huge challenge. Thank you, Drisha. We have three minutes to finish. If anybody wants to add any last word, you're very welcome to do so from, from the speakers. No? Um, yeah, go ahead, Jennifer. <laughs> no, I just want to say um, it's been um, a great privilege to be in the midst of women like yourself and to be asked to come and speak today and share um, the experience, um, my experience and the experience of a lot of other migrant women like myself. Um, but more importantly, more importantly, it's um, for us as human beings to always remember that whether they are migrants, irrespective of where they are coming from or who they are or who you think they are, the only way you can know who they really are is by getting close to them to understand them. One thing is very important to always show people the respect you want to be shown, to always give people the chance you wish yourself to be given. Um, that is just what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Unless we have any other last comments from anyone, I do not see. In this case, I think I'm going to say a very big thank you to, again, all the participants for coming on Thursday evening to join us, uh, share your experience, and all the women who contributed to the report and everybody who participated in the webinar. And um, we're really looking forward to continuing this conversation, but more than conversation, actually doing something about it. And I couldn't agree more with Drisha that we need to be on the ground working with women while also changing the system because we do not want more traumatized women that we need to help. We need less traumatized women. Um, I'm going to stop the recording here and the streaming and say thank you very much and say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much to everybody. <laughs>